welcome to our first ever virtual seminar. We like to do these seminars a couple times a year just to kind of share some information about the different procedures that Dr. Diedrich does here at MidAmerica Plastic Surgery. And like I said, this is our first virtual one. So hopefully everything goes well. Uh, hopefully my phone doesn't die. It's been charging for a while, so it should be good. Um, but yeah, so Dr. Diedrich is kind of the itinerary that we'll go through today. Um, Dr. Diederich will do a presentation on breast augmentation with implants, lifts, kind of all of those options. Um, and then we'll have a Q&A session at the very end. And then we'll do a little drawing for some people who are SVP. So if you have any questions, feel free to message them in the chat. That's part of Zoom. Or if you want to be a little bit more private where your um, name isn't showing up for everybody, you can always text um, this phone number, 618-288-7855. I also have it at the top of the chat for you to reference um, later on in the meeting. Um, and then Dr. Diedrich. So Dr. Diedrich is our board certified plastic surgeon. He went to undergrad at SIUE and Edward, or sorry, in Carbondale. And then he went to medical school with SIUE as well. And then he completed a six year residency where he trained in plastic surgery specifically. So a lot of experience, all of that before he opened the practice in 2011. So he's got a few years under his belt there. Um, but his most common procedures are breast augmentation, breast lift, and then also tummy tuck. And that will be a seminar for another day. So next up is to get kind of started on the breast augmentation with Dr. Diedrich. All right, thank you very much. If you have questions, you can see the number at the bottom. Uh, feel free to text or you can do them in the chat. Um, first time we've done this and uh, you know, feedback is very welcome. So we'll go ahead and get started today. When we're looking at breast augmentation or even just breast in general, I feel like there's three things you need to look at. The volume, tissue laxity or looseness, and then the tissue location, in other words, breast location. And we'll go through each of these. Um, breast surgery is very common, 300,000 breast augmentations approximately in the U.S. last year. Um, there was and, just over 100,000 breast lifts, just under 50,000 um, cosmetic breast reductions. The first part we'll look at is breast augmentation volume. There's a lot of reasons you're looking for more volume, whether this is weight, you know, volume loss after pregnancy, after weight loss, there's um, differences between the sides, asymmetry, or maybe you just never had as much volume as you wanted to have. Two major ways to add volume. The first one is breast implants. The second one is fat grafting. So adding volume with breast implants. The advantage of a breast implant is often it's the most predictable way to give you the volume you're looking for, and often the most predictable way to give the upper breast or upper pole of the breast fullness. There's a lot of comments, especially when you go on social media about implants. Remarkably, the most studied medical device in history is breast implants. Um, you know, you would think it would be something else, but it is absolutely breast implants. Negatives of breast implants, though, is they're a man-made device, and they are not perfect. There are problems with them, for sure. And at some point in your life, you know, the device is going to fail. It's going to have a leak. You're going to have to address it again. So although they're not perfect, often they are the best way we have to give you um, what you're looking for and to accomplish your goals. First thing we like to talk about, saline versus silicone. The advantage of a saline implant is really if it leaks. If it leaks, it goes flat, you take it out, you put a new one in, you're on with life. Disadvantage is that it is a bag of saline. We fill it with IV fluid. So it feels like a bag of saline and it has a little bit more risk of rippling or irregularity. The advantage of a silicone is really the feel. It's much more natural feel, a little bit less risk of rippling, the problem with silicone implants is um, if they leak, you may not know. So detection can be a little bit more difficult. FDA previously had said that you should get an MRI over time to check the implants. Uh, these guidelines are evolving right now. The latest recommendations have changed. We're very fortunate. We have high resolution ultrasound in our office. So I'm actually able to screen your implants for problems. Um, this has been one of the best things we've changed in about the last year and a half. 
um, because I can finally get in office quickly, no cost to you, a look at the implant and um, check the status. Silicone implants, the other advantage is they come in a variety of thickness of gel. And each of these from the thinnest to the thickest have their advantages and disadvantages. You know, I tell everybody, anytime there's options, that means there's no perfect. So it's always about what's right for you and what you're wanting to accomplish. On here, from the left to the right, really is looking at the thinnest gel to the thickest gel. The advantage of the thinner gel is that it settles in your breast. It goes more to a natural shape. It doesn't have as much fullness on the upper breast. The disadvantage is those same things. As you go to a thicker gel, you get more fullness on the upper breast and it starts to maintain its shape a little bit more. The problem is if you have your own breast and the implant maintains its own shape. Sometimes those can compete with each other. So we look at you, it's very personalized depending on your goals and your natural anatomy, and we figure out what's right for you. Another example of that. The next one is smooth versus textured implants. And really the difference is the surface of the implant, whether it's just like it sounds, smooth or has some degree of irregularity, roughness to the implant. The advantage of a textured implant is that it tends to hold its position a little better. And if the implant is in front of the muscle, it's slightly less risk of getting hardening of the implant. Now this is debated um, right now, but most of the literature supports that. The problem with texturing, if you've been online, you've seen what's called ALCL, anaplastic large cell lymphoma. This is primarily associated with textured implants. Depending on the company depends on the rate. And it really has to do with what's called a macro or micro textured more than you need to know. You just have to know the differences can lead to this problem. I'm fortunate I sit on the American Society of Plastic Surgeons ALCL committee. It's um, great because I, you know, I have the latest information on this. To date, there has not been a case of smooth implant with ALCL. This may be debated right now. There's one under investigation, but it's very, very rare. Um, if you, you'll see this talked about in the news right now, and what they're really referring to as of now is textured implants um, in particular from one of the companies. So when we do implants, you can put the implant in front or behind the muscle. Again, this is very personal depending on your breast tissue. If we consider using a textured, Today's day and age, most plastic surgeons are deciding to go under the muscle with a smooth implant just to eliminate the risk of the texturing. However, again, what's right for you is what's right for you, and we need to examine and find the right solution. Three, some people would say four approaches to breast implants. You can go in through the armpit, around the areola, or under the breast. If you need a lift, then often we go through those incisions, which I'll explain later. If you don't, the most common is to go under the breast. There's some pretty good literature that supports going through the areola or the armpit, has a higher rate of infection and hardening of the implant. The fourth way, which I just kind of glossed over, is through the uh, belly button. It's a trans umbilical. It's very, very rare today. I think it was a, uh, only a few did it. It didn't stay around very long, so. Another way to add volume is with adipose tissue, fatty tissue. This is much newer way to do it. And there's, again, advantages and disadvantages. The way we get the, fat, the adipose tissue is liposuction. Most patients are very happy with that. We then process it through different methods immediately and separate it into the portion that we need. And then we proceed with re-injection. The advantage of fat grafting for breast augmentation is once this is healed, once you retain the fat, it's yours for life. You don't have to mention, mess with it again. There's donor sites, which normally when we talk donor sites where we're taking it from, people see that as a negative. Well, in this case, when you're taking fat, a lot of people say, well, that's actually a positive. It gives us a little more freedom. Implants, for example, come in shapes, sizes, dimensions, predefined. When we're doing fat graft, we can sculpt, we can change things a little bit more um, as needed for the person. And the other pro or con is that 
it doesn't behave like breast implants. And I'll explain what I mean. Some people are happy about that, some aren't. Final thing is you can actually supplement implants with fat grafting. So why do implants exist? Are they still, why are they still the dominant method for uh, the most common for breast augmentation is because the fat is a little bit less predictable. What I mean is when you inject it, you, you can only inject so much at a time. You can only add so much at a time with fat. Also, how much of that fat survives is a little bit unpredictable. So it, depending on the volume you want or your goals, you may need multiple procedures in order to accomplish this. Back to the, how it doesn't behave like breast implants. Theme of the night, gravity's the devil. Fat behaves like fat. So it has a tendency to settle more. It doesn't maintain its fullness up top as much because it's not as thick as a silicone or a saline implant. So, you know, the negatives of it, the upside is long-term, it's all yours. It's all natural you. You don't have to mess with it again. Downside is it can take mo more than one procedure takes a little unpredictable and it doesn't look the same long-term. Short-term, I really think it does. Long-term, it will settle a little more is my personal belief. Sizing. This is talked about a lot as well. I always say, don't think in terms of cup size. Bras are one of the worst inventions ever. There's no standard. It's incredibly variable. Even some of the good bra shops, um, if you have two people size, they'll come up with two size. So in the office, you'll try on implants, the thing I don't hear much, but I really do believe it is take a pair of nylons like stockings, put rice in it and CCs, and then wear it around for a day or two. It gives you time because you'll hear the statement. My friends say they wish they would have gone bigger. Why does this happen? Two reasons. One, they walked in an office like ours, tried on implants for 10 minutes, and they said, oh, there we go. Well, they didn't take time to get used to it. So with us, we would always rather you come back as many times as you need to be comfortable trying implants. We always encourage you at home, wear it for a while, get used to it. The other reason some people say, I wish I'd have gone bigger is because they were swollen. Anytime you do any kind of procedure, you're a little swollen, you get used to that swelling, you like it, and then it goes down and you say, oh, I wish I was a little bigger. You have to be careful. That's a slippery slope because no matter what you do, it's always gonna swell. So I say, take your time up front, determine what your goals are, make sure you're happy, and never look back. So um, again, another thing is don't ask your friends their implant size. You can ask a million things. I think it's great to talk to your friends. Um, online research is good, of course. You have to be careful with that. But I could have 100 women before and after, and you'd swear they have the same implant, and they're totally different implants. And it has so many factors that go into selecting the implant that we'll walk you through. Final thing is, in our office, we have 3D imaging. It's pretty amazing. We will give you a simulation of what we think you're going to look like. I warn it's a simulation, but it is pretty remarkable. So second component, tissue laxity. So common theme, gravity is the devil. Um, if we can figure out how to overcome this will be great. So two parts of settling of a breast. It can be either the entire breast, in other words, the nipple and areola position have settled, or just the breast tissue has kind of fallen out the bottom. You, it, It's not as um, secure as it was, things called Cooper ligament stretch in the breast settles. The only way as of today on a breast to get rid of extra skin or extra tissue is to remove it. I've seen some gimmicks out there. They don't work. Um, really, you have to get rid of the tissue. The other myth I like to bring up is that bigger implants will help lift. And I've actually seen this done by plastic surgeons. Oh, we'll just add volume, lift you more. I see these patients a lot. They're coming to me after having it done elsewhere. They're disappointed. Almost always someone who tries to fill skin with a bigger implant or tries to lift with a bigger implant doesn't work. And what you result in is what's called the water to fall deformity where the breast is actually falling off the implant. Um, and it's remarkable how many patients I get who are revising because of that exact problem. When we're doing a lift or a mastopexy, there really are scars. There's no way to good way to do it without scars around the areola, down the breast, some degree underneath, depending on your particular needs. Other thing I like to mention, it, lift, mastopexy, is not the same as augmentation in a lift. What do I mean? Common theme of the night, gravity is the devil. So when we move 
your tissue up with a breast lift. Initially, you're very full. You kind of feel like you got an augmentation. And then over the six months to a year or so, the tissue settles. Um, here's a, this is even a fairly early post-op example, but she has a much more natural upper breast. This patient has a little bit more fullness in her upper breast. Um, both very natural looking, um, you know, not overdone, but there is that subtle difference. So if your goal is to add fullness in the upper breast that's long lasting, it's very difficult to attain without getting an implant. Again, gravity's the devil. Also, the thing to think about is if your tissue naturally stretches, whether that's just your genetics or perhaps that you've had significant weight loss, then your tissue tends to stretch. You have to think about that. It will settle over time to some degree. And there's things we'll talk about that we can do to fight that. In this example, smaller breasts, less tissue, less stretch. With implants, they stay in position. When you have a little bit more tissue, you are going to see a subtly different look. And you, you know, we're making, especially if it's straight implants, we're making you larger. We're not really changing you. So how do we fight gravity? Well, if we're doing a lift, what we'll often do is what's called auto augmentation. And I do this in almost every patient I can. I take the bottom gravity dependent portion of the breast. We tuck it under the breast and try to secure it higher in the breast to provide an implant like look. Um, some patients are just looking to be smaller. We'll actually take out the lower portion of the breast. So it's that part that's going to recur, the part that gravity is gonna work on, we get rid of it. And then there's another product called um, Galaflex. It's often known online as the internal bra. I've been pretty impressed by this. It's, it's not perfect, uh, but it can make a difference. And the way this product works is we insert it. Over about seven months, it resorbs and your body leaves a, a thin band of collagen that literally functions like an internal bra. It's providing extra support. Next thing is tissue location. Where is your breast tissue located? And again, when you do an implant augmentation, we're making you bigger, we're not changing you. So the patient on the left, her breasts are close together. She gets her implants, she's close together. On the right, breasts are further apart. That's her natural anatomy. So as she augments, she will be further apart. There are things we'll talk about later, these composite augmentations where we can address that if you want. Um, it just has to be a little bit different process. Combination breast procedures. We do not live in a world that one size fits all. You know, what you need is tailored to you. And I see that often um, incorrectly where we have an implant, let's put it in. That's what's right for you. And that's not always the case. We may need to look at other options as well. So as talked about, when you're looking at the breast volume, use implants or you can use fat or combination. When you're looking at loose skin, tissue laxity, we're looking at a mastopexy, which is a breast lift. We're looking at you're getting rid of the lower portion of the breast, especially if you're using implants. Um, a majority of the time, we will get rid of that. I see that mistake a lot where they leave the lower portion, the gravity to portion, gravity dependent portion of the breast, and it recurs early. So our goal is to get rid of it. Proportions of breast determine how they behave. So if you are mostly breast, very little implant, you're going to behave more like breast. Setting, settling is going to be faster. If you're mostly implant and less breast, you're going to behave more like implant. And when you're here, we kind of go through, um, you know, in particular, how that will behave for you. Auto augmentation, if you're not using implants, we try to add that volume back up. Internal bra we talked about. The other thing we haven't talked about, though, is, you know, the breast is really not just on the front of your chest. It's a 360 degree structure. You've got side of your chest wall extends around to the back. And I think it's important to think about this, especially as we're looking at the breast tissue location. Sometimes we need to remove tissue. Sometimes, such as the wider breast, you may want to add fat in the central portion to help bring your breast closer together. Um, so really, when we talk about a composite breast lift or a 360 breast, um, or I'm sorry, a cause, uh, composite breast augmentation or 360 lift, we're really trying to address not just volume, but every aspect that you would like to change um, to try to get as close as we can to what you're looking for. So recovery, everybody's unique. So these are definitely generalizations. 
Um, we do rapid recovery breast augmentation. I will warn you, it's not like you're not going to have any discomfort. Um, you will have some discomfort. For straight augmentation, um, around half of our patients say they could have gone to dinner, could have gone to the kids' soccer game. I mean, they're not feeling perfect. I don't want to lie to you, but they could do those activities. A lot of steps we take to make this happen. A lot of them you won't even know. They're before, they're in the procedure. Some things you can do after, um, gentle shoulder rolls and stretches about 10 times per hour. Don't wake up for this, but you know some of the discomfort is like a Charlie horse on your muscle. So if you can just help stretch that out lightly, it can make a difference. We provide muscle relaxers. And then starting the day after the procedure, if you can tolerate it, if your stomach tolerates it, you're able, ibuprofen, 600 milligrams, three pills, three times a day for about five days. It is amazing how much quicker the swelling goes down and how much more comfortable you are during that recovery. Bathing, we let you shower in 24 hours, no pools or tubs for two weeks. Activity, light activity, avoid it for eh, one to two weeks. Moderate activity is three to four, like heavy labor, real construction type things, at least six weeks. Exercising, I won't lie, back down a little bit to help prevent problems. I don't really want anything that bounces the chest like running or works your chest like chest like pec weightlifting for about four weeks. But I do want you, even immediately afterwards, get up, walk around, prevent pneumonias, prevent other problems. It's always good to be active after any procedure. You're doing light activity, nothing to raise your blood pressure for about 72 hours and then increasing from there. Six weeks, you're back to normal life, but the reality is full recovery, full final results can be about three to 12 months, most of it early on, of course. So if you have any questions, we're more than happy to answer them now. How do I choose which implant is best? So the question is, how do I choose which breast, which implant is best? That is a tough question, and it really depends on your goals. First choice that I think is difficult is saline versus silicone. Again, if it's the advantage of a saline implant is just that peace of mind. You're never wondering if it's leaking. If it leaks, you wake up and like, well, the implant went fat, uh, flat. A lot of people are always worried they're going to get hit. It's going to cause a problem. We actually have a video where we drove the implant over with the car and it doesn't leak. So implants are tough, but they will leak at some point. The trade-off though is, um, you know, it's just not as natural a feel. The silicone, harder to detect. High resolution ultrasound has really helped with that, but it's still not perfect, but you're getting a much more natural feel. Depending on the thicknesses, that's where you get into a little bit tougher conversation in silicone. Some of that depends on how much fullness you have in the upper breast, um, how much you want, also how much breast tissue you have. Uh, if your breast tends to settle, we try to stay a little bit thinner because what can happen is your breast can actually um, not move well with the implant if you have significant breast tissue. And, and it just doesn't, it doesn't feel right. It doesn't necessarily look perfect. So we try to match the thickness to your particular breast as well as your goals. And it's one of those things, it's a tough, there's no one fits all or there would only be one type of thickness. Um, we really need to look at you, look at your goals and then have a conversation about it. Um, and then what if I choose a size that is too big? Do you give any advice on that? Um, what if you choose a size that's too large? Um, that's a tough question. If, you've, if you're coming to us and you've already had an augmentation, then the conversation is where do you want to be? It's very difficult to determine. You also have to worry about a little bit of skin laxity now that you've put the implant in. With us, I would say... Um, one, if, if we think you're going too large, we're just going to tell you. We're going to warn you based on your goals. We're very upfront and honest about that. Um, the other thing is take your time. Like this is, this is not a five-minute decision. This is a lifelong change. And so I would say, and not everybody does it, but I really love doing it at home. I love when patients do their own sizing at home because you wear it for two, three, four days. Um, I hear nationally numbers thrown around 10, 20% of people wish they had picked a different size. In our office experience, I'm going to say 3% is probably closer to one or less percent because I don't think everybody takes the time to pick the right size. Um, take your time, you know, come in as much as you need. We don't even have to, we can let you in. We can let you try them on. Um, again, I'd rather you come back 20 times, get what's right for you.
Um, and then what is the downtime for somebody who is a hairdresser for a lift and augmentation? What is the downtime for a hairdresser, a lift and augmentation? I'm not going to lie that that profession is tough and it's not the things you think about. So I always say light activity one to two weeks, um, more physically demanding, holding your arms up is three to four, heavy duty is six. You're going to find my answer is not as perfect as you want. It's because it's kind of personal however you're doing. Now, I definitely would take two weeks. If you do go back to work after two weeks for the next two, you really probably need to slow your schedule, take some breaks. And it mainly has to do with your job is one of the most difficult for recovery because of your position. And it's not going to be things you think. You'll be working, you'll think things are great. Most common complaint I hear from hairdressers is they go to push on the pump to do shampoo and oh, it hurts because you're activating exactly that pec muscle, which can be sore. Um, a little bit of common sense here too. If you're doing too much, it's getting sore. You feel like you're swelling in that after, you know, a couple weeks back, um, slow down, you know, so really try to be good. Try not to pack your schedule, um, listen to your body. And I think that's the hardest part, especially for those of you that have kids, you know, a few days in your kids don't care. You had something done. So I have stories of, you know, moms three, four days in, five days in, they're, they're going to be careful, but their kids need things. They're going to soccer, they're going to hockey, whatever they're doing, and they're carrying things all day and they get home and they're sore and they're a little swollen. So, you know, try to be good about listening to your body. Um, and then can you explain kind of more about the process of how we try on implants in the office? Sure. How do we try on implants in the office is the question. The way we do it um, is we, we basically come in and we will provide you with a bra that fits you. We have a variety of sizes. These are not padded, so you can see what you're going to look like. And we actually use implants. So they're never the exact implant because selecting the exact implant for you, it is, you, you would be fairly surprised how many options there are. And we fit it to your width of your chest, your uh, projection, the forward motion of your chest. We basically analyze you and fit you um, exactly what you need. But in the office, we have some standard sizes. You try them on. And what we do is we start small and we work our way up. And a lot of patients will come in and be like, oh, that's big enough. Well, let's go one higher. And we always push you one more, one more until you say that's too much. Because initially it can be a little surprising. You're like, ooh, that's a big change. That's not, I don't want any more. But after you have a few minutes to get used to it, you say, oh, maybe I do like that. And so again, that's why I think people say they wish they would have gone larger. When you come, also feel free. Bring a tank top, bring a swimsuit, bring something that you want to try on and see how you look. Once we've selected the size that way and or you've selected with at home, we also have 3D imaging. The 3D imaging is pretty amazing. Um, it simulates uh, really what you're going to look like. And again, it is just a simulation, but it's pretty remarkable. So. And then the last one, how do you minimize scarring? Great question. How do you minimize scarring? So I always like to tell people I'm a plastic surgeon. I make the best scars ever. The reality is I am probably 20% of your scar. You are probably 80% your genetics of how you're going to scar. Um, it, it, there's a lot of things you can do in our office. Initially, we're going to have, um, especially for if there's an implant involved, we put glue over. You can't even get to the scar for three, four weeks until that glue comes off. Number one thing you can do to improve your scar, avoid sun, even up to a year or two, because as long as the scar is red, it can tan, it can change color, and that can be permanent. So be really conscientious about sun exposure. The other thing is if there's any concern, this isn't leaving a flat scar, um, we'll often give you like a silicone gel that you can put over this that can help flatten it. Um, we've had a few patients who just get thick scars and we'll do things like steroid injection. Um, but for by far the majority of patients, it really is do the procedure, put the coverage on initially, and time. Um, I'd say by far the majority of our patients don't need anything done. Their scars fade to a fine line. That is a generalization because again, everybody heals different. So. And then that's the last question. So I'm gonna do the um, cool. drawing. Okay. Oh yeah. All right, we're gonna do a drawing today for those that were here. 
and or may but not. But don't actually say the name for okay. privacy reasons. So there we go. Uh, so we'll, if, if you were the winner, we will be reaching out to you and letting you know. Um, if you ever have questions, I, you know, the things I like to tell everybody, if you have questions, please, please, please call. We're always around. We're happy to hear from you. After your procedures, if you ever need anything, I don't care if it's two in the morning, you're calling us, you're letting us know. You know, this really is a team of us working with you to get your goals. And, um, you know, our real goal is to make you happy, to give you good results. So we're always here for you if you need us. So, thanks for joining in um, to the first uh, virtual seminar we've done. Hopefully it was educational and we look forward to seeing you. Thanks, guys.